Welcome to the Game Changer Performance Podcast. So excited that you're here and uh, excited for my interview today. Get to spend some time with somebody who I really admire, respect, somebody who has really become a friend over the years, uh, a coach at uh, my alma mater, Creighton University. She coaches the volleyball team, has been there for uh, 20 plus years and uh, incredible success. She's also a mother uh, of three daughters and a wife. And uh, so excited to invite on Kirsten Booth. Thanks so much for spending some time with us. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Well, it's, I tell you what, reading through your resume and just all the accomplishments, we don't have enough time to go through it, but I do believe you're entering your 21st season. I know. Uh, I think I think anytime you stay somewhere that long, no matter what, they can make you look good. So I think that's that's more of what's going on. Rob Anderson, our sports information director, is that good. Yo, Rob, Rob knows how to track all the stats, bring all the data together. He does a good job. Talk, talk to me about that, though. I mean, you've been at Creighton for 21 years. Before that, coach kind of small at a pretty small school. How'd you get connected to Creighton? How'd you kind of start your coaching journey as a whole? Yeah. Well, I'll try to give you the quick version, but I'm from Lincoln, played high school volleyball, but I was more of a tennis player. I actually thought I was going to play tennis in college. Okay. That's where I would have gone D1 for tennis. I was a D2 volleyball player, yep. went and played collegiately. Um, and I, kind of by the end, I was still liking it enough that I wanted to be involved. And so I went to Iowa to get my master's and I was in love. Now my husband, he was going to law school there. So uh, I thought I wanted to do academic side, um, maybe okay. a dean or a president. So I, I got my master's in higher ed admin, but I helped the, the Iowa program. If you can believe it, the coach quit mid-season. And so they had an assistant as the interim. And so they did a coaching search afterwards and they got rid of the whole staff, but they thought wow. I was seemed like, a, and so I'm 22, they thought I was a decent wow. kid. They had trouble with the staff and I became the interim head coach at Iowa at 22 for that spring. Wow. Which was crazy. I was clueless. I mean, I, I, I apologize to those guys, but I think what it did is it, it looked good on a resume and gave me some opportunities. Yeah. So after doing some high school, went to a junior college, did not build that program, um, was following someone that, and I didn't know anything about JCs. I mean, I'm just cutting my teeth and making lots of mistakes. Um, and then how I got the Creighton job was, I mean, the the program was three and 23 and at that point they were playing in yep. a high school so they didn't have a huge candidate pool right. um and bruce rasmussen obviously you know bruce well the athletic director reached out to terry pettit now terry pettit was the longtime coach at nebraska prior to john cook and okay. um kind of the godfather of, of nebraska volleyball and pettit helped with the search i love telling this story because how pettit uh, how I got to know Coach Pettit was his daughter was a freshman on the volleyball team when I was a senior in high school. And I didn't know Coach Pettit at all because he was coaching okay. his team. But Catherine was the setter behind me. I was a senior and she was a freshman and she was really good. And I just liked her. I mean, there wasn't any ulterior motive. But Coach Pettit always said that he appreciated how I treated her. Wow. And so that opened that door for him to pass on my name. Wow. And that got me the interview and, um, you know, just really fortunate. You know, it's just a good lesson of how you treat people makes a difference. You never yeah. know when encounters, you know, hopefully you treat people kindly because that that was transformational wow. for my life. Wow. That's so true. I, I think the older you get, the more you recognize that every interaction matters, how you treat not just people that you admire and respect, but maybe those who are below you, some of the lower classmen sometimes who we don't always treat with the most respect, but such a testament to just who you were even as a young person. And, and Rass, Bruce Rasmussen, he has an eye for talent. He has an eye for picking great leaders. I mean, I think you're a, a, a product and a picture of that. Where, where did he see you or like what did he see in you that really, you know, caused him to want to take a chance on you? I think Rass does a great job of evaluating character. Yeah. And, and, and I don't say that about myself, but I think if you look at the coaches that he hires, that is a high priority. And sometimes you miss, I get that, but nope. you know, even coaches that haven't had great success were good people, you know? Yep. So I think that was really important to him. The other thing that he did for me um, that I think is missed is he got me mentorship when I, I mean, I was 27. Wow. I didn't, I mean, I really was set up to fail. 
but what he did was he, you know, Terry Pettit, he hired Terry Pettit to mentor me, who still mentors wow. me to this day. Wow. And that was huge for me. Huge. Um, you know, and then as he just supported, I always felt like he, you know, if I was struck, I could go to him with my struggles. I think some coaches feel like you don't go to your AD or your boss with right. I'm struggling because you don't want them to think there's any issues. I always felt very differently with RAS. I could be who I was, um, you know, if I had concerns, if I didn't handle something well, I could tell him and he could help mentor me through it. So um, I had, you know, Josh, I had no idea that I was walking into one of the best athletic directors in the country when I, right. you know, and I wasn't even smart enough to know I should be looking for that. Now, now I get the yeah. importance of yeah. the AD. Um, but man, I was so fortunate to just land with him. And I mean, that's why one of the reasons I've stayed, the culture here has been so great and, yep. and, you know, just, you know, good people. I mean, right through that wind, that uh, yep. wall is Jim Flannery, the women's coach, right. women's basketball coach. Like, you talk about a good human, you know, and yep. I get to office next to him every day. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Such a picture of Rass's leadership in a practical way. He hires you and he, he has a mentor mentoring you. Who's one of the greatest volleyball coaches, you know, in the state probably that he knew and was connected to. That's a powerful leadership move. Mm -hmm. But then, like you said, just that open door policy where you could bring your challenges to him. I mean, a testament to who he is. And, and obviously where Creighton university is, as a whole athletic uh, department. You, you come into a program, they just won three games. Not, not a winning culture, not a winning team. Obviously, you know, you, you're a part of turning that around with the whole kind of, I would say, turnaround of the athletic department. But from a volleyball perspective, you know, what did, what did those first couple of years look like for you? What did you know that you needed to start doing in order to create this winning culture um, and, and really just start to build a foundation for the future? Well, the first thing I always say is I was scared. And I think that's important for people to know, you, you, you know, people <laughs> think it's easy, right? Like I, yeah. any good job, there should be some fear, I always say, right? So I, I didn't want to fail. So that kind of drove me. First thing that I did really well was I hired well. Um, you yeah. know, I think to be great at anything, you have to try to look in the mirror and I know it's hard and say, what do I not do great? Yep. Um, and so I, I the first hire I made, made was Paul Gieselman. I don't know if you know, Paul, Josh, but he's the head coach at Midland university. Okay. Now he'd been a NAI coach prior, way more qualified than I was 10 years older than I was. And we really almost co-coached and we fought and, you yeah. know, I, I really developed with him. You know, wow. um, and then I hired Angie Oxley Barons, who's now with me forever. So that was huge hiring yeah. good people who could challenge me. But once we went into the gym, they always had my back. And I've always really admired mm. Paul because he he was way more qualified to be the head coach than I was. But yeah, wow. he could still go into the gym and support me. You know, yep. um, we had good good humans in the program. I mean, they'd come off a really poor year. They were ripe for change, but they weren't bad young women. You know, yeah. it wasn't that I had to like kick a bunch of bad kids off, right. you know, we did have to change some culture things with, you know, it was definitely, definitely a hierarchical team. Like the, the freshmen were kind of stupid freshmen. You have to do yep. this. We're going to, you know, so that was a transformation of like, you know, one of the things we talk about now is how can we treat our freshmen so well that yep. they feel welcomed and servant leadership and you know, all those things that, are kind of counterintuitive to yep. athletics or Greek life or, you know, pick your poison. Right. Yep. Um, so changing those things a little bit. Um, and then we, we wanted them to play fearlessly. And so what that mm. looked like was reinforcing, taking smart risk. We'd cheer for errors if we thought, thought it was the right decision. Wow. Um, and we'd get on them if, if we thought it was a scared decision, even if maybe that tip scored, yep. that was, that was a fearful play. That's not the way we're going to play. Yep. We're going to play to win. So that's, that's always kind of been something that's been important to us. And then, you know, I think the other thing that maybe I now understand that I do, but I think just kind of intuitively, even when I was a young coach, I, I tried to never make it personal of you play bad. I don't like you. You yep. play good. I like you. Like yep. I, I always want our players to know I love you, you know, no matter what, you know, yep. if you have a lousy game now, if you don't act certain ways, we're going to have discussions, right? Yep. If you come in with a lousy attitude, you know, all those things are, are 
non-negotiable behaviors that we have to do to be part of the program. Yeah. But I'm going to love you through that too. You know, so I think that I don't think when I was a young coach, I would use the word love as much, but now, you know, yeah. as I've evolved, uh, but I hope even the coaches when I was really clueless or the players, even when I was really clueless knew that I cared about them. I hope that that still came through. Yeah. So good. It's more of a transformational relationship, bigger than just wins, losses, performance, not just performance based. And uh, we're, 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 the podcast is called Game Changer Performance. But I think one of the important things that you just said is how we treat people, how we interact with people isn't performance based. We want to see people operate at their highest potential, but it doesn't happen just because we're keeping score of the wins and losses and how people are acting. There is a transformational relationship. I love that. I love how early on you, you talked about hiring people. You hired coaches that were as good, maybe even better than you. And, and having the humility, though, to interact with them, I think a lot of leaders sometimes you only hire people that you can delegate or tell what to do and you're afraid to hire people that are better than you. And so, I mean, you talk about winning, building a winning culture team. It's bringing people around you that complement your weaknesses, but also make you better in other other areas. You, you talk about uh, the, the environment when freshmen come in. I, I remember when I was a freshman. I hated how I was treated. It oh, was really? that it was that top down and not by everybody. I wouldn't say by everybody, you, but you can tell there there are those seniors who have been waiting for their turn to treat somebody probably the way they were treated. Absolutely. And, and that culture can be reinforced. That's something, you know, my brother Josiah, who's going to Creighton, we talk about that stuff all the time when he was a senior in high school and the culture he was creating and building. There's nothing worse than being on a team and and being uh you know treated as the new person and uh so i love that that's something that you you really created and then the whole celebration side of things uh, a phrase that we use a lot and i've heard from other leaders what you celebrate gets repeated and so celebrating fearlessness again whether the play you know you scored a point or you didn't that behavior gets repeated and some sometimes we think that by criticizing or calling out, that's how we'll get the behaviors we want. But studies show that the more we celebrate what someone's doing, the more they'll repeat that behavior. So yeah, that. You, it, again, there's no secret to success. There's not a secret to how you got to where you are. I mean, these practical steps that you've taken have built the culture that you've created now. I mean, you guys are, uh, you've won nine in a row. Uh, conference championships, the Big East. Uh, in the Big East now, when you started, you were in the Missouri Valley. Mm -hmm. Where was the the shift for you where you felt like, okay, now we're we're building something? Was it when you moved from the, the Valley to the Big East? I know that's when some of the, you know, streaks have started right before then. But where would you say internally you felt the culture shifting and you felt like, okay, we're, we're building something now? Yeah, I... I don't know. I felt like our culture, we had some hiccups, you know, those first few years. And, and some of it was, I, I can look back and say, and a lot of times those hiccups might be a player or two that were so angry with how I handled something. Maybe they yeah. went to the bench. Right. And, uh, and I think as I've gotten hold, older, I can, it's still not perfect. It, it's hard. It's, yep. I mean, I, it's, our culture is not perfect every single yep. day. So I don't yep. want to make it seem like it's perfect, but I have learned as a coach th to, you know, have conversations earlier as compared to then they become, you know, combative or, you know, nope. confrontation later. So, so those things we have gotten better, but I do think our culture was pretty good. Most years we, I can think of a year uh, early that there was some challenges, but where, you know, we made our first tournament in 2010, but we were on the bubble. I didn't think we got like hosed or anything, but we were close a couple of years prior, but yep. that hurdle was huge. I, I felt like I'd won the national championship. That was my yep. ultimate goal for the program, Josh, was to make the NCAA tournament. Wow. So when wow. we made that in 10, I mean, I just remember it being really emotional. In 11, we had the hardest year. I, I talk a lot about 11. I lost the team. It mm. was um, definitely my toughest coaching year, made lots yeah. of mistakes. Um, I brought someone in to help us in that spring who still works us with us, Dr. Widman. Mm. Um, and that was, again, sometimes you learn your most and your diff most difficult times, right? Like yep. that was transformational for our program because, you know, like the idea of 
you're never bigger than a player, you know, some things like that, that were just big things with our program. Yep. But in 2012, that was, a, I think that was the moment that we've had some sustaining. And that was our last year in the Valley. And we won the Valley that year is the only time we won the Valley. So that wow. was a really cool thing yeah. before going into the um, big East and then, you know, the challenge of sustaining it, the big East uh, Marquette and Creighton have, have won it every year that we've been in it. I mean, at this point, and, I'm not naive that that could change <laughs> in a month, right? Yeah. But right now, Marquette and Creighton are the two, you know, top programs. And then we've had some teams that periodically come in there and uh, make the tournament or upset us on the road, you know, as we go down that journey. But, yep. um, but I don't know, you know, I feel like generally we've had good culture, but again, I'm not naive that it could, you know, we haven't like right now we've got 18 young women on our team that are all spectacular women who are all working their tail off. Yep. And only like nine of them maybe are going to play. Yep. So how do they handle that? You know, so all those things are going to be challenges. And I'm not naive that culture could change quickly if someone that has influential leadership on this team decides that they're not on board and they're, they're just, you know, destroying things in the locker room. Now I'm optimistic that won't happen because we try yeah. to do a lot of things to help that, but I'm not naive that it couldn't happen. Right. Right. Yep. Yep. How how has has NIL and the transfer kind of portal mentality has that affected volleyball the same way it's affected basketball and football and and specifically the Creighton program has it has it had much effect on how you lead and coach? Well, we've uh, been fortunate that we we really haven't had uh, you know at least players transferring out that are that are playing a lot on our court and I again I'm not naive that that yeah. could change especially with people buying players I mean I would say right now our our I, I hate to call people marquee players because they're all they're all yeah. valuable right we yeah. all know this but uh those players probably could go make some better money but I think they're yeah. they are young women that are very committed to their teammates in the program so I I don't live in that short term fear but I think the long term fear yeah. I know that's there the money isn't isn't nearly as big as it is in football and men's basketball but there is money and some programs are giving um significant money away um and we 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 have a collective we're trying to stay I think we're 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 probably in the top 20 in the country on doing things. So we are definitely staying competitive. You know how much this community supports. Yep. Um, but it's, it's hard, you know, our, our athletes are already so fortunate. So to go to a donor and say, Oh, and could you donate to the collective so we can give them more money right. um, is kind of a hard sell. Uh, our players for their collective money, they're doing community outreach and, um, you know, the rub with that is, and I say this all the time to our players and to other people is that I never want them to think when they're doing community service that they expect something back. And, yeah. you know, so we're creating that a little bit. So we try to do way more service than they're contracted to do so yeah. that they are recognizing the importance of, of service learning. And, um, but it's, it's a new beast. And, uh, I don't know. I think there's a part of it that thinks I'm glad I'm old cause I'm not sure <laughs> I'm able to navigate this. In you're, you're on the. The opposite end of where this thing is probably headed and, and leading to as it continues to evolve. I just got to say this too. I mean, over the years, you know, since I graduated at Creighton in 2009, been a part of our nonprofit Abide, you and your teams have participated and been a part of community outreach. You've supported in a variety of ways. Recently, you guys helped put on a volleyball camp on our campus, which was phenomenal. So and so you, you do a really good job of leading by example. And, and your girls were phenomenal. I mean, their hearts to serve and give and have fun with the kids was contagious. And so that part of the culture and, and I've heard people in their, you know, in their, in their speeches after they're graduated and done some of the most impactful parts of their story at, you know, in college at Creighton will be those community service outreach 100%. opportunities. And it can lead to, you know, some people even pursuing a, a career in that. So just well done in that area. You know, talking about the success, again, you enter this season, high expectations, you know, typically, again, expected to finish at the top. Uh, got a great, great team coming in. Is it harder to sustain and maintain that level of success? Or was it harder to get to the point where you're competing for championships on a consistent basis? 
I think the sustaining is probably harder. I don't know if I would have said that when I was in the middle of the, the growth, but, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, this is what I would say, you know, when you, when you're 300, which is where we were trying to build to top 50, right? Yeah. You can outwork coaches, you know, you, you know, you can, I just felt like there were opportunities to yep. low hanging fruit that you could kind of climb above and, and we are in a hotbed of talent so we could find great athletes. We, yep. you know, as we developed, we were supported financially from our athletic department. So I, we did have some things that were huge. Um, but you know, we just kind of incrementally grew and it just, it just kind of was a stepping stone each year. It, uh, you know, our goal was never to become great immediately. It was to do it the right way, build the foundation and just build on top of that. And I think we did that pretty well. Now, when you're top 20, top 15, everyone is well coached. We are right. competing against people that are more funded than we are. You know, um, we compete in recruiting primarily against the Big Ten and the Big 12. So there's challenges with that. You know, a lot of people, a lot of young women want to go play in the Power Five. And so so you're you're having to sell them on maybe talking to your athletes and their experience. You know, yeah. if, if a kid really dives in and talks to, I mean, we always say call any of our players, like call anyone, starter, non-starter, whatever. Yeah. And we hope that's going to help a young, you know, as a girl's making a decision, have the forethought of saying like, okay, I know I'm going to have a good experience here um, or, you know, hopefully. So, so anyway, I, they both have different challenges, but they're both, they're both awesome also, you know, yeah. like, uh, but yes, I feel stressed. I mean, it's almost like if we don't win the big East, it's a failure. Marquette was a sweet 16 team last right. year. Like, right. <laughs> you know, so. And then, you know, the, everyone just assumes you're making the NCAA tournament. Well, you know, making the NCAA right. tournament's hard. And now right. we got to make a run. So you feel that pressure. But, you know, Doc always says pressure is the privilege. So, I mean, you know, you <laughs> lean into it and that's yeah. a good place to be in. Yeah, that's good. No, it's such a good word because when you're at the top, everybody's gunning for you. And mm -hmm. they'd love nothing more than to spoil the season that you're expecting to have. But then there's something about being on that building side, too, where you're trying to get to that that top of the mountain and trying to work. You know, one of the things I hear you say is once you get to the top, the margin of, of victory, the margins are so much smaller. And so finding ways to be better on a consistent basis. I know I believe it was in 2020 you helped develop an app in Neurofuel. Yes. And it's all about mindset and visualization. And I mean, talk about a little bit about the app, but about the role that plays in an athlete's ability to maximize their performance. So when going back to that season in 2011, when I lost the team, Dr. Larry Woodman started to work with our program. So as he continued to work at the time, it was a culture thing that we worked on. But as yeah. he, as our culture evolved, it went into the power of meditation and calming, you know, your brain, it went into the power of visualization. There's so much research on that, you know, right. and then also he has something called the elite building blocks on how do you communicate, you know, all these different fundamental things that go into your mindset. Right. Um, so we would do a lot of these things out loud as a team. We did visualization as a team. We'd just talk them through it and then COVID hit. And so one of the things that we tasked them with was to visualize five minutes every day because we weren't getting to work with them. That was their practice. Yep. And a few weeks in, some of the players said, we are just really having trouble doing this without someone talking us through it. So I called Dr. Widman and I'm like, where could I find something like this? And we look and look and there was nothing. So then I asked one of my assistant coaches to start recording audios that we could send to the team. Wow. So then it, it evolved to, hey, if this is a need for us, this has to be a need for others. What right. I've learned through this app is that most people weren't doing mental training at all. Yeah. You know, so where it's really been helpful and it's it's geared a little bit, we have a lot of college teams that use it and then a lot of, it's geared a little bit more toward the adolescent age, Yeah. Um, is that coaches have nowhere to start and it gives them a starting point of where to go. And it, I, I'm so proud of the app. I, you know, I'm kind of out of it now. I mean, actually, we did have a meeting today, but we have the CEO and some full time full time staff that are running it. Yeah. Um, but I believe in it so much. I mean, you know, we're doing it with our team. They listen to an audio before practice every day, and yeah. you know, it could be. Uh, you know, there's a whole section on positive self-talk. So yep. right before practice, reframing, how am I going to talk to myself? Because usually we're the meanest to ourselves, right? right. 
Right. When you missed a shot, it wasn't your teammates yelling at you. It was Josh yelling That's at right. you. That's right. So how am I going to reframe so that I'm not nasty to myself? So yep. there's there's a million different things, but that idea, and I um, I just really, I think it's, I'm not, you know, I hope that it helps. And, and not everyone, not all kids are like totally bought in. Yeah. But hopefully, but hearing stories of kids that it's been really impactful for is, you know, makes it all worth it. So it's been pretty cool. Huge. Do you, do you practice any of that? Like personally within your day, you know, g give me a picture. What, what does a, a day look like for coach booth, you know, in terms of routines, habits, rhythms that kind of get you in the right state and then also uh, help you coach your team? I would say my version of meditation is a lot of working, not a lot, working out. Like I, I yeah. I'll work out each morning. My knees are getting bad. So now I'm walking. So I, I think you can, it's just a great time to either just think yep. or um, I listen to a lot of podcasts at that point. Just, yep. you know, I, I love, I always say I need sleep and I need to work out. Those are the two things that <laughs> required. But yeah. So I'll wake up in the morning. Now I, you know, day one, take kids to school and yep. then uh, work. And um, I like to be at home with the family and, you know, I enjoy dinner with friends and things like that. I, 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 uh, I would say it's a, it's a boring, happy, consistent life, but I, I think as a coach, um, one thing that I do think is important and as a parent that I think is, consi is, is that consistency and, yeah. you know, that they know, um, that they're going to get the same mom or the same coach every day. You know, what's going to trigger me is going to be the same thing that triggers me every day. Right. And I'm going to yeah. handle it similarly, no matter what. Um, so yeah, my days aren't too exciting, I would say, but just trying to do the right things, you know, day in and day out so that I can make sure the team's prepared and that, you know, that my yep. kids know what they're getting at home. So good. I feel like throughout this time, as I'm listening, I'm like taking all these mental notes down of things that I can walk away with. Even just the reminder of the power of, of mentors, the power of, man, finding out the people that need to be surrounding you that are going to help push you to be better the power of just every day, you know, building, building, building. I love the, the NeuroFuel app. I downloaded it just so I could check it out. And there's something about listening to a voice that helps you uh, just slow down and be still and internalize some things and visualize some things. Um, it, it, it's so, so powerful. Uh, one of my last questions is you've coached a lot of great players. And, um, you know, sometimes we get young people who are listening to this podcast and their desires to be great and they want to perform at the highest level. What would your encouragement to them be as you've coached again? A lot of players, probably some who exceeded potential, some who didn't live up to their potential. I mean, you've seen probably the whole spectrum. How would you encourage a young player to really get better, leverage what they have to reach their potential? You nailed it. The I mean, players that have exceeded what I would have thought coming in have a similar trait of they're mentally resilient so they can, they can have a bad day, they can have a bad swing, and yep. they, can, they can rebound and, and, and be ready to go the next day, right? Or the next play. Um, they work hard consistently. I mean, I, I just think, and that's not just in the gym when the coach is watching. The, the kids that yeah. do amazing things are, I mean, we give lots of resources here, but there's lots of resources, I think, at a lot of levels nowadays on like things like sleep and how we eat and how we hydrate yep. and taking care of classes. I always tell an athlete when I recruit them to Creighton, if, if you need me to go and make sure that you go to class, don't come here because I'm yep. not going to show up. Yep. If you need me to call you and say, are you in by 10 p.m.? Because that's our curfew tonight. Don't come here because this uh, this is not, you are not the player for me. Yep. I want players that want to be great and are willing to do those things. So, A, being willing to do those extra things. Yep. But I think the real challenge as a coach and, and maybe even more as a parent because you're dealing with kids at a younger age is how do you make them mentally resilient? And that's that's the hardest part because even as a coach, the kids that are mentally resilient we can give way more feedback and, and you know enough about us. Our, if you come to our gym, we are about as positive as they come in, yep. from a college. It, probably too positive. I think that's enough. <laughs> enough. We don't try to yell at them enough. Yeah. But we do give a lot of feedback and the kid that shuts down isn't getting the opportunity to learn as quickly as the other kids because yeah. we have to pull off them because we can tell they're near tears or they're, you know, whatever. And 
that's hard for us to fix at 18 to 22. So what you're doing, you know, when the kids are seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, and I know it's simple stuff, but watching, you know, you know, if your kid goes to the bench in a game, don't tell them that sucks. Tell yeah. them, Hey, even if you disagree, like we, we as parents have to say like, Hey, this is part of it. Yes. You know, like sometimes yes. we don't get the role that we want. Yep. One of my daughter's best years was she got put on the second team and they knew right away they made a mistake. It was the best year for her because yep. she got to be a leader. And so like we as parents have to reframe it's these good. tough times. And I, and, and I used to say that stuff before I had kids. Now that I've had kids, it's hard. It's yeah. hard. <laughs> and our kids hurt. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. But we can't fix the hurt. They have to go through it. And I think... Good. The kids that have gone through it sometimes are more resilient when it comes to just training and things like that. So good. Yeah. Next, next podcast, we're going to talk about parenting in no, youth sports. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, other parents. I'll talk about other parents. I'll talk about other parents. <laughs> it is hard when it's your kids in those it environments. It's one thing to talk about it from a coach's perspective or even just from a leadership perspective. But when it's your kids, you feel it differently, feel it. but and I Josh, couldn't agree I, more. Yeah, I, I will I'll leave one more quick thing. When I got pregnant the first time, um, Ra Bra Bruce Rasmussen said to me, and again, you're telling your AD, it's going to, you know, you're out. You, as a woman, you just don't know how people are going to react. And his yeah. response was, this is going to make you a better coach. And wow. I've always thought that was the coolest response. And it probably didn't happen until my kids were a little bit older, but it, it absolutely has made me a better coach because... I, I understand the feels of a parent. Now we still have to train our parents and our kids to handle tough things. Yes. Well, like you can't yes. be the crazy parent, but yes. I understand sometimes internally you want to be the crazy yes. parent, but you just yes. can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, you're, you're, our kids are watching and how we react is how they're going to react. How we process it with them is how they're going to process things in life. And as 100%. we know, sports is such a great opportunity to learn for lessons of life. And for ultimately, most of us aren't going to spend most of our lives in sports playing or coaching, but we can learn so much in those oh, different seasons. Well, I'll just say this. I love talking to you. I love hearing your perspective. You've done an incredible job just with building the culture, uh, with building a program that is known for winning at Creighton, especially known where it started and where you started. I love the journey, the story. I love how you coach your players. And uh, just grateful for you, your friendship, and for taking some time to, to be on the podcast today. I'll say this. Uh, I know people can follow the Creighton volleyball team. Uh, go to games. Check them out. High expectations this year. It's going to be fun to watch. I know my daughter, uh, who was a part of the, the camp this summer, she's super excited to be to be watching and following. Future and, Blue Jay, hopefully. Hey, who, who knows? I, I would absolutely love that. And especially if you're still there coaching. So... Thank well, you. I want to say thank you. You, I mean, what you and your family do is so impactful to our community. I just really admire you and your family, and, and it's awesome. So thank you for letting me be a part of this. Yeah, grateful. Let's go Jays. Have a great season. All right. Thanks, Josh. <laughs>